Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. On today's show, Edwin Diaz is back and what a return it was. We also review the starting rotation as well as some spring training roster battles. As always, we close out the show answering your mailbag questions. So subscribe to the Mets Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. You can watch every episode on SMY's YouTube channel or wherever you get your shows. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Mets Pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And be sure to subscribe to the Mets Pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, or wherever you get your pods. If you'd like to drop us a review, we'd really appreciate it. And moving forward, feel free to drop your questions there uh, with your review. We might use that question. We probably will use that oh, question. Oh, we will. We will on use the show. that question. Yes, those yeah. are priority questions if you leave us a five-star review. You can also watch the show on SNY's YouTube channel. And make sure you subscribe to SNY's YouTube channel there for a ton of great content. YouTube will also be another mailbag drop point from now on. So leave your questions in the YouTube comments below this video right now. And we will also look there to grab them for the following week's show. So people have been asking us, Joe, if I don't have Twitter, how do I get you guys questions? And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, that's problematic. So we've come up with two new ways. You don't want to be leaving a review every week. So you do that one and that one's guaranteed to be in. But we will be looking at the comment section from the previous week's YouTube to get more questions in. All right, to the Mets, Joe. What better place to start than the trumpets blaring down in Port St. Lucie for the return of Edwin Diaz, who struck out the side and looked like vintage Edwin Diaz. I think you and I, but that might have been our favorite moment of being down at spring training is watching Diaz throw BP, uh, you know, really leaving guys like Lindor and Pete Alonso looking back at the dugout, like, what do you want me to do with this? And no surprise, Joe, Diaz looks like he hasn't lost a step at all on the mound with his big return from injury. I mean, I got like a little bit of chills when the trumpets actually hit on TV. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a big moment for the fifth inning of a spring training game on yeah. March 11th. But, you know, just see, being able to see him in game action, we knew, like you said, when we were down in Port St. Lucie, we saw him throwing live BP and he looked just like normal Edwin Diaz. And we kind of forget that, yes, he missed the whole season, with a catastrophic knee injury. Like it wasn't just, you know, some run of the mill injury that just wiped them out for a few months. Like the patella tendon is, that's a gross one as you, you certainly know about during football. So hit yeah. just how I hard he it. worked. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, how hard he worked to get back and he was close to getting in game action at the end of last year. And I think if the Mets were contenders, there was an outside chance you would have seen Edwin Diaz pitch, but instead he got an extra few months of rest. And like you said, everything just looked normal. Fastball 97 to 98, the wipeout slider was making the Marlins hitters look silly. So just a really exciting day for Edwin Diaz and for the Mets, not just on the field weights, what he will bring, but what he's going to bring just to the clubhouse. I completely agree, Joe. I think it's a great thing to highlight that, when the Mets lost Diaz before the season even began last year, they really did in a way lose the heart and soul of the team. And there are so many layers to that with Diaz. He is one of the most beloved players in the clubhouse. When you talk to everybody and it's everybody, it's players on the Mets. It's people that cover the Mets. It's the organization as a whole. I mean, there's a reason, Joe, they made this guy the highest paid reliever at the time before the free agency that year. They wanted Diaz to be a part of this organization no matter what. The dominance on the field, it speaks for itself. We don't really need to even go into that because we talk about Edwin, Edwin Diaz's dominance every week on the show, and we're lucky we get to do that. But I do think in sports, what isn't analyzed enough anymore in this era of analytics, which is more quantifiable, is emotion. And I think with Diaz, there is something to the emotion of the ballpark at City Field when the trumpets blare. When the Mets get through seven innings and know if they are in trouble in the final two innings, whether it's the eighth or the ninth, because we saw Buck really lean on him in the eighth plenty of times in 2022, that they have a guy that gets out of it almost every single time. And that, I mean, there just aren't many guys in sports that have that ability. And I think that it kind of spread a different confidence throughout this team in 2022 that they were clearly lacking in 2023. And 
I know what some people are thinking. David Robertson, before he got traded away from the Mets, really held the fort in the ninth inning for this team last year. And the Mets' problems were not closing games in the ninth inning. But we often talked about on this podcast the trickle effect that had. that The Mets had a lot of problems in the sixth, seventh, and eighth inning and that they couldn't always get to David Robertson. Well, the plan was that Robertson would get to Diaz and losing Diaz uh, completely wiped away that bridge. So I think that if you want to be optimistic about the Mets, and I'm going to be honest, today's going to be a pretty optimistic show because the Mets have had a good spring training so far and it needs to carry over into the regular season and nothing is guaranteed as we've learned over the years. But I think Diaz's return, Joe, it, it really can't be appreciated enough what it'll do for the entire dynamic of the team. I think in some ways we took for granted what Edwin Diaz did in 2022 and didn't quite didn't quite grasp it until he was gone for all of 2023. And, you know, when we had Trevor May on the show back a few months ago, I remember when we asked him about just the feel in the clubhouse when they knew Edwin Diaz was coming in. It was just like, yeah, we all knew the game was over. So there was just a different confidence that came with it and not a, a negative towards David Robertson. Like you said, he did an admirable job filling in, but the players are, are just simply not going to have the same feel with David Robertson coming in the game as they did Edwin Diaz. So I think this is a uh, obviously a massive step for him and it's, it's going to make him to me a big difference on the 2024 season. It will. And speaking of, obviously, the bullpen as a whole is a big talking point, and we will get there in a second. But I think before we do, we have to talk about this starting rotation that, you know, we're going to be really careful here, right, Joe, that with spring, you, I mean, this is this is what I joked about, you know, before is that this is a podcast last year. Think about how high you and I were on David Peterson coming out of spring training where Nobody could touch him, and that didn't carry over into the beginning of the season last year. But the reality is you want your players to perform in the spring rather than not perform because if they weren't performing in spring, you'd be like, oh, boy, we might really be in trouble for the regular season. And the Mets right now, their rotation, their team pitching, which has the lowest team ERA in all of baseball this spring right now at 264, They've gotten big performance. I mean, McGill looks really, really good. And McGill's a total wild card on this team because we've seen McGill have big time performances. We've also seen McGill be a guy that he just can't go beyond four to five innings at a consistent rate. And let's be fair to Tyler McGill. It's not like this dude is 32 years old and we're assuming that this is just what he is. I mean, he is somebody that's 28, doesn't have a ton of big league experience. Let's see if he could develop into a little bit more. And if the Mets can actually develop some pitching, Severino, I mean, fingers crossed, because a lot of it is about health, but I don't have any questions about the stuff. This is not a dude that is a shell of himself when he was a great pitcher for the Yankees. It's about staying healthy. And then, obviously, we've talked about Adrian Hauser a lot before on this show, and he's exactly what we thought he would be. The rotation, Joe, I don't think this is going to be a top 5, 10 rotation in baseball, but I think if they can find a way to be adequate and middle of the pack with the depth they've acquired, it totally changes the perspective of the team. They just have to carry over the spring performances, where in the regular season, you're going to be seeing lineups for second and third time all the time, and that's a big difference into that regular season. One of the funny things is it's going well. So naturally, fan reaction is everyone relax. It's just spring training. Right. But if they, <laughs> but if they were getting shelled, or are doing that those same people would be like, see, I told you Luis Severino wasn't any good. But ultimately, when I look at how spring training is going, the results themselves don't matter a ton. Like the ERA is great. Like they lead the league. I think it's by over a run or close to over a run. So it's a it's a significant gap. But I'm looking for the stuff. How do they look on the mound? And Luis Severino, like you said, stands out in a big way. Velocity is there. He worked hard on his changeup at driveline this offseason. That pitch looks crisp. The breaking ball is there. So now he needs to make sure, one, he finds a way to stay healthy, which he has not historically done. And two, find a way to limit the pitch tipping, which has long been a problem of his. So if they're able to kind of put those couple things together, I'm very optimistic about Luis Severino. Uh, Sean Manaya cuts his hair adds a mile an hour to his fastball. 
He was ninety. <laughs> he was ninety two point six average in his first start. Cuts his hair. Second start, ninety three point five. So he basically went up a full mile an hour, maybe a little more aerodynamic. Uh, but I think it, what really what a good sign there is the velocity increase that he had last season in San Francisco. It's not quite the same right now, but it's up from his career norm. So he is kind of in the in the middle of those two numbers, which is a good sign. Um, he emphasized the sweeper in his second outing, and that pitch looked chef's kiss. It was he had a couple really good strikeouts on it. So Sean Mania was uh, impressive in that sense. And Adrian Hauser, he's a guy that clearly, if he locates his stuff, he's going to be fine. If he doesn't, he's going to get hit around because it's. It's not big stuff, but he knows how to just get under the barrel of the bat. And you saw him do that in in his last outing where he went 10 up, 10 down, struck out, I think, five or six, but more ground balls from him. So I think he's going to be perfectly fine at the back end of this rotation. And then, like you said, Connor, Tyler McGill is the ultimate wild card. He's added the new splitter. He's he's incorporated a curveball a little more this spring than he has historically. So maybe you're going to see him expand his repertoire a bit and he's still young enough like you said that there could be more to untap with him uh but yeah they just need to find a way to not just carry over a 265 era into the season but just not let the starting pitching be the downfall of the team that's exactly it you're trying to set a floor and i think with all of these guys it's about making their starts i don't if the mets rolled out for the entire season Quintana, Severino, Manaya, Hauser, and McGill, with obviously Senga coming back, we think somewhere around Memorial Day, we'll call it, or a little bit after that, you know, you'd sit there and go, they'll probably be fine if the offense performs to the back of their baseball cards and the bullpen is the strength we think it'll be. The Mets will hang around in a, I won't say in a wild card position, but contending for one in August when things get really, really interesting. That's that, you know, 84 win mark we'll call it the Mets will be hanging around they'll be three to four games out of a wild card spot you would say but we know the reality is with all of that health and that's a, a really big thing for Severino most notably McGill pitching deeper into games Quintana's a guy that typically is reliable but had a really tough go of it injury wise in the first half of last year and then Manaya, who if we've seen the lows of him moving to the bullpen at some point for the Giants last year, and then we've seen the highs of him being a guy that is very, very hard to hit. So there's a lot of variance with this rotation. So I think the overall point is it's good to see them have consistency in spring because you'd obviously prefer that rather than the variance that's expected with them. Something else that, you know, we kind of led with with Diaz's return is this bullpen right now. And We've been joking, but I don't know how much of a joke it is anymore. It feels like a guy in Nate Lavender, Joe, is really pushing to be a part of this bullpen. I don't know if that will be necessarily right out of the gate, but he's been striking out hitters at an extremely high rate this spring. And when you look at the bullpen, it's not a ton of spots open. The Mets did sign a lot of one-year flyer types. They do have Brooks Raley and Edwin Diaz already here and Drew Smith, and obviously options come into play. But we were wondering, Joe, out of all of these different names in the bullpen, who's going to have the big spring? And it's been the spring of Lavender. Nate Lavender's been fantastic, and he is not going to make the opening day roster. I believe the other day the Mets already demoted him to minor league camp. So – the plan is not to have Nate Lavender on the opening day roster, which you have, like you mentioned, Brooks Raley. You also have Jake Diekman. Do you really want to carry three lefties? I know there's some reverse split stuff with Brooks Raley that maybe. The reality is at some point in time this season, we are going to see Nate Lavender on the team. He's not on the 40-man roster, so they didn't. They don't have to add him uh, until they want to have him at the major league level. Um, obviously, once you do that, that brings across all the options he has. But just to give you a synopsis of what Nate Lavender is and, and why he's successful. Um, so he's a former 14th round pick. And uh, article, I believe it was Will Salmon, friend of the show, wrote that in one of his first spring outings, he had an extension of 7.4 feet which extension means basically how far from the mound is the baseball upon release. And if he's able to sustain that number, that would be in the top 1% of baseball. 
and his induced vertical break on his fastball, which we've talked about a few times on this show, that kind of gives it that riding motion. He's around, you know, above average amongst pitchers. He's in like the 17 inch or so range where 18 inches is considered to be good. So he's kind of just a touch below that. But that extension gets him closer to the plate. The vertical break makes it look like the fastball jumps a bit. So when he's throwing 90 to 92 visually for the hitter, it looks like 96. Like it just comes up on you faster. And that's a, an instance where I think analytics really do play a bit of a role. Uh, like I heard Nate say in the locker room after his first outing, and we, we were there in the clubhouse, and he said something about like he throws his 92 with might and that makes it better and whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know how quantifiable that is, but having this analytics can explain to you why that fastball is so successful and he could throw it almost down the middle and throw it past hitters at lower velocity. So very interesting guy that is, um, I think, proving to be a player development success story. Yeah, the throwing the fastball with might is the equivalent of dog meter, basically, for <laughs> Nate Lavender, who absolutely has it. And, you know, to be fair, and you highlighted a lot of these things just now, Joe, this is not somebody that showed up at spring and everybody was like, who the hell is this? And why is he striking out every single hitter he's facing? Last year, as a 23-year-old, between double-A and triple-A, I mean, he was striking out over 14 batters over nine, and you highlighted the stuff. So what every level this guy pitches at, he is striking out hitters at an alarming rate. And clearly, since being drafted by the Mets, you called it a player development success story, 14th round pick. I mean, he is tapping into more and more to maximize his stuff and is a legitimate strikeout pitcher. And... You know, we talk about the the uh, the lefties in this bullpen and how he's blocked at the moment right now. But the overall goal of the Steve Cohen era is developing your own relievers like this. So you're not getting to the winter market every single year and going, well, we, we need one year, six million dollars allocated to a lefty because we just don't have anything in the system. The goal is that you have guys like this in the system at a high quantity that one of them is going to hit and fill those roles. So you're allocating all of your dollars, keeping below the luxury tax at some point to the big boppers, right? Because these little things do add up over time. I mean, you talk about three relievers over, you know, six million dollars. That could be a 20 million dollar player right there. And that's the Mets emphasis on pitching right now. And watching him this spring has been a lot of fun. All right. How about two guys that are a little bit more high profile names? They did come into spring with everybody looking at them and focusing on them and Brett Beatty and Mark Vientos show. It feels like with Viento specifically, we've seen the opposite field power in the spring that I think the Mets are praying that can carry over to big league, actual regular season big league games. And he's hitting the ball so hard. The other day, I think he went two for three and every ball was north of 100 miles an hour yep. exit velocity. So this is what Mark Vientos does. This is what he's always done. Like what I'm seeing with him this spring is the Mark Vientos that I saw in double A the Mark Vientos that I saw in AAA. Maybe part of that is he is facing some AA and AAA pitchers. But at the same time, just like we were talking about at the top of the show, it's better than the alternative of him not hitting them. So I'm optimistic about what Vientos is going to bring offensively this year. And I think the opposite field power, it just shows how strong of a kid he is. He could, he could turn on a fastball on the inside part of the plate as well. But if he's a touch late, he is strong enough to just push it out the other way. And um, especially if there's some wind aiding, that'll help too. But he's a strong kid that can take the ball the other way with authority. And if the Mets give Mark Vientos a legitimate shake at this, where he's playing nearly every day at the designated hitter position, um, I, I, I don't see a world that he's not going to hit 20 plus home runs. And that's the goal. I mean, right now with the Mets, if you told somebody, hey, Vientos is going to hit 20 plus home runs and He's never going to be a guy that hits 300, right? That's not what you're expecting, but does he hover around 240? Can you draw some walks? Can you hit 20-plus home runs? Can you be the guy in the majors that destroyed lefties in the minors and start to destroy lefties at the major league level? Because one of the Achilles heels of the Mets lately, uh, uh, the last couple of years, has been struggling against left-handed pitching. That's how you cement yourself a role with the team. And, you know, on the flip side of it, I feel like, 
what we've seen from Vientos in the spring, especially lately, it feels like the last week with the power and hitting the ball hard. I don't think it's been the same story for Brett Beatty, Joe. It's not that he hasn't had hits because he has had hits here and there, driving in some runs, uh, laying down a bunt single, taking advantage of defensive positioning. But the harsh reality of Brett Beatty is if he's going to be a major league player for this team and the team's third baseman, he needs to hit the ball hard and he needs to hit the ball gap to gap. And occasionally he needs to hit the ball over the over the wall because he's not a savant defensively at third base. He's not a guy that we think is going to hit left handed pitching this year. So that means he's going to have to show a little more power. I guess it's spring. I'm not overreacting. But you want to talk about somebody that you would have loved to see and get off to a hot start in the spring. And Vientos is kind of holding his own in the spring. Mendoza said it. He looks confident. Everything he's worked on in this offseason is translating to the plate. A lot of the pitchers, the things they worked on in the offseason is translating to the mound. I unfortunately have not felt that way with Beatty, and I'm really hoping it can get going in these next two weeks. So Brett has kind of flashed a little bit he had that one home run i think he hit that at like 100 111 off the bat so it was a, a really hard shot he hit one 106 right off of jacob barnes's rear end uh which i think keith hernandez called a bohuckus or something like that which in, in in vintage keith uh keithisms but the the reality with brett Beatty is when he is right spraying line drives and he's a big strong kid so the the line drives will carry when he's not right, which we have unfortunately seen a decent amount of so far this spring, is he's just hitting the ball on the ground. And uh, right. you're gonna hit you're gonna hit ground balls. That's an unavoidable thing. But Brett Beatty needed to emphasize elevating the ball, and maybe that's something that will c- get better. Um, but I- I've seen too many ground balls from him this spring. So you know, contrary to Vientos. I'm not 100% sure how to feel about Beatty heading into the season. And if, you know, we're building a lineup, and I know we'll talk about lineups and stuff, I might put Brett Beatty behind Mark Vientos and let Vientos bat bat ahead of him, depending on, you know, the lefty-righty splits and everything. But Brett Beatty just, he hasn't stood out yet this spring. It's not that he's been bad, but he just hasn't done what I wanted to see. If you're going to get out, I wanted the outs to be elevated. Fly out to right field. Don't ground out to the second baseman. So our last bit from spring training here, Brandon Nimmo, all the chatter around Nimmo is now where he's going to hit in the order. And he's been a guy that's been, you know, Brandon. it's Brandon Nimmo. He'll do whatever the team asks of him. He is the ultimate professional team player. He does it all with a smile on his face. And quite frankly, for Nimmo, there's been a little transformation. And Joe, we have been on the record kind of hinting at, let's see what kind of player he is this year. Let's just not assume he is a totally different player. But Nimmo from, you know, about 2018 through 2021 was a guy that can hover around getting on base at a 400 clip. But he was never a guy that was going to hit you 20 home runs. And then in 2023... I mean, he's hit 274 the last two years, but and he's had an OBP right around right around 365. But with that, the power has gone up. We saw 24 home runs from Nimmo last year. He's played over 150 games the last two years. He's going to be moved off a of center field this year for Harrison Bader. Hopefully, keep his legs even more fresh. I mean, he's got 13 triples over the last two years. He is hitting the ball hard, Joe, and you have to wonder. Not only with that, but the pipeline of these players coming up that profile as hitters in the one or two spot because of the speed, getting on base, making things happen. Jet Williams, a guy that we think can work the same kind of at-bats that Nimmo makes pitchers start the game off working so much, long at-bats, seeing the ball really well. I think this is an interesting wild card in the Mets' pocket right now. And I don't think they have to play it out of the gate. That's the beauty of it. The Mets can... Go into the season, Nimmo's the leadoff guy. It's worked before, it's a proven formula. But if the Mets get to a point of the season where one of Acuna or Jet Williams or Drew Gilbert is just tearing it tearing it up and they need a call-up, it's an interesting wild card to be able to play, especially as we have this conversation all the time of who's going to hit behind Pete Alonso. We think it should be Francisco Alvarez, but I don't hate if it has to be Brandon Nimmo at some point either. 
the flexibility is obviously what's the most enticing thing. But where the roster stands today, there is not an alternative to Brandon Nimmo to bat leadoff. Uh, the reality is the guy at the top of the order, his primary objective is to get on base. And if you look at projections for the 2024 season, there is not someone within like almost 30 points of projected on Lindor's base. Lindor's not that guy, by the way. Nimmo. That's the name I always yeah. see. That is not Lindor's player profile at all. No. I like Lindor in the two or three spot. That's those are those are spots that I think Lindor profiles best. So to me, you keep Brandon Nimmo lead off, and like you said at the outset of, of your thought, Connor, um, see what Brandon Nimmo is this year. Is Brandon Nimmo now a twenty-five home run, three sixty on base guy instead of a fourteen home run, four four hundred on base guy? And sure, Brandon Nimmo doesn't steal bases, and I know there's a lot of talk about. Uh, you need to bring stolen bases back at the top of the order. When you mentioned Jet Williams, I had tweeted that um, the other day, that when you look at Jet Williams, you look at Luis Angel Acuna, those are two players that have potential leadoff profiles, but they need to get here first. And they need to get here and show that they can handle big league pitching before you're already just thrusting them to the top of the right, order. Right. In a dream scenario, Jet Williams is like the epitome of a profile of exactly anything you could want in a leadoff hitter. He's a plus on base guy and he could run and steal bases. So he's like the perfect blend, which I think would allow you to have Nimmo flex to the two spot. Or like you said, maybe it's behind Pete Alonzo. Uh, but where, where we stand now, I think, and Carlos Mendoza mentioned this, that right now when everyone's healthy, Nimmo's going to bat leadoff. So I think this is a bit of a future discussion, but it is something to keep in the back of our heads as maybe something that can happen where, where we have Brandon Nimmo now and what we n know him as previously may not be what he is as he heads into his thirties. There's no way to close out this open without mentioning the spring breakout game. Isn't just a couple of days from now. It'll be March 15th. The broadcast starts at six o'clock. Gary. Three o'clock. Three o'clock. That's my bad. Six o'clock is the regular game. They do a double header. Spring breakout, then the Mets play a regular game against the Nationals. So turn on the TV early. Gary Apple will be on the call. Uh, Jim Duquette will be in the booth with Gary Apple. Michelle Margot, of course, will be handling the dugout side reporting role. And our very own Joe DeMeo will appear on the broadcast. Who better to have on the spring breakout broadcast? Than you, Joe. I, I mean, I want to keep this. Number one, this is going to be awesome to watch. You are uh, the perfect person to join this broadcast with all of the young talent. And I think this is such a great thing that baseball is doing, showcasing this kind of talent. What do you go into this game looking for? Because it feels like it's the classic. Your eyes could be going in 30 different directions. Is there something that you want to center in on for this game when you guys are on the call? So first off, very grateful for SNY to uh, have inviting me to to join the broadcast to talk about these prospects. And uh, to your point, Connor, I think the sport of baseball gets a lot of grief for things, sometimes warranted. Uh, but when it comes to growing the game, I think this is exactly what baseball should be doing. So it was a great idea to come up with it, which to, I, I guess, uh, high level tell people what the spring breakout game is, if you're not aware the Mets will be playing the Nationals, and the Mets have a roster of their top prospects, and the Nationals have a roster of their top prospects, and they're going to play a seven-inning game. Um, so what I want to see is I want to see the guys I haven't seen yet. I haven't seen Brandon Sprout pitch. He's someone I'm very excited about. The stuff that I'm hearing about him at, down at spring training, um, already nearing that triple digit on his velocity that we saw when he was at the University of Florida, and he's already been in the pitching lab and he's already working with the development. And uh, there's been growth on his fastball because there was a lot of questions coming out of the draft with him about, yeah, he throws hard, but the shape of his fastball isn't good. It was kind of like a straight 100. Now with the four seam fastball, they've tweaked some things and he's been up to 18, 19 inches of vertical break when things are right. So I'm very excited to see him and a lot of the other pitchers as well, Tyler Stewart, we're going to see Blake Tidwell. Uh, so a lot of the top pitching prospects will be there. And it's been a big pitching spring down in the backfield to Port St. Lucie. And then on the offensive side, of course, we have Jet Williams, Luis Angel Acuna, Drew Gilbert. 
but we saw those guys already. They played in big league spring training games. It'll be cool to get a look at Ryan Clifford, who he's listed on the roster as an outfielder. Um, so I'm interested to see if he plays the outfield during the spring breakout game or does he play first base? Uh, but either way, it's just a cool opportunity for, I think, fans to see these prospects that they hear us talk about on this show. And now you get to actually see them in person play baseball. Absolutely. Just a reminder, that will be at 3 p.m. on March 15th, broadcasted on SNY. Can't wait to hear Joe. You join Gary, Jim, Michelle. It's going to be a great broadcast. So much talent on display for that game and a lot of talent uh, that this podcast has been hyping up for quite some time. All right. You're listening to the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Subscribe to the Mets pod at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SMY's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your shows. Let's jump into the mailbag here and What better place to start than with some YouTube questions? This one from, this is quite the long name, but I think it's Florida Lease Event Center 2525. In 2021, Spencer Strider was the Braves' 26th best prospect. Now he is rated as the top pitcher in the MLB. DeGrom came out of nowhere to be the best pitcher in the world. Who are the next Strider DeGroms in the future? Are these guys made or born? FYI, I hate the Braves. Just an, an incredible all-around <laughs> YouTube comment. Now, Joe, I feel like this is a pretty tough one to throw to you because it's not every year in baseball you get the next Spencer Strider or Jacob DeGrom. But I guess I'll ask it like this. What makes those guys become that overlooked players that end up coming up to the big leagues with unicorn-level stuff, whether it's the really the breaking ball, the electric slider, uh, the fastball? And is there anybody across baseball or in the Mets system that, listen, you don't have to call them Jacob DeGrom or Spencer Strider, but we did talk earlier in the segment about Nate Lavender being a 14th round pick, and now he looks like he could be a high-end strikeout lefty. Is there anybody else in the system like that? So when you talk about how these pitchers kind of become, it is a combination of player development processes and the work ethic of the player because the player development system can tell you to do this. And if you don't do it, then it's, you know, for naught. And the special players like the Spencer Striders, like the Jacob DeGroms, they have that next level of preparedness and and work ethic to get there. And sometimes a lot of them, like uh, Jacob DeGrom, for example, went to Stetson University and, you know, not not to ding Stetson, but I don't think they're known to be like the foremost uh, university on developing pitchers. So DeGrom you know, largely could have been mostly throwing as a college pitcher. And then he gets in the pro ball and the Mets teach him how to pitch. And you hear a lot of pitchers say that kind of old adage of you're a thrower, not a pitcher. And I think those kind of guys are are very unique to go in the Mets system. You know, not, I would not put any expectations of being a a multi-time Cy Young award winner on anyone. And if you asked me just a few months ago, I would have talked about Christian Scott because he is a guy that came from, you know, a fifth round pick college reliever being turned into a professional starter. And his stuff is very unique on the fastball, the slider. Um, He has a sweeper now, too. So he has those two different uh, sliders, which is player development, um, you know, developed for him. And he has a split change to go along with it, locates all his pitches. I know he's kind of hot on radars now a bit, but I think he's a guy that I I don't even think we've seen the best of Christian Scott yet. I think there's even more to untap in him. And you and I spoke to him in Port St. Lucie, and uh, you can attest to it as well. This is a guy that's ready for the information and knows how to adapt it into his game. He It's so natural to him, I think, is the key. Him and Vassal, I mean, both of them, it's just so natural to them, which is fascinating that we're entering that era of pitcher that is so mentally invested into data and transforming the data into physical results. And that, you know, that trio, and when you include Hamill in it, they are so invested in their own development. And when you look at them physically, there's no questions physically about any of those guys that you believe it's going to work out for them uh, completely. And, And I think this is, this, and not everybody's going to be DeGrom and Strider, but the player development stories of, hey, we, you didn't hear about this guy for 10 minutes in the first round of draft night on the bro- right. on both broadcasts. This is becoming more and more popular. 
All right, let's jump over to Apple reviews for this question from Tom from New Jersey, who has been to uh, a couple of our live shows, which we really, really appreciate. Tom asked, if Trace Thompson continues to hit this spring, do you see him finding a spot on the bench? I realize he's not on the 40-man roster, and Tyrone Taylor and DJ Stewart already are. Two backup outfielders projected to be on the bench, but it would be hard to ignore him if he keeps hitting despite his career mostly being a journeyman with the Dodgers and White Sox. Joe, I think this kind of just opens a conversation. Do you think the Mets went into this spring with their minds set on Taylor and Stewart being on this team no matter what? When you look at, you know, Thompson's had a good spring. I've jokingly, but not so jokingly, brought up G-Man Choi having moments, and he's been a big league bopper before, and we might just need to, you know, keep him keep him chilling somewhere for when they play the Yankees. Um, but in all seriousness, how do you look at what Trace has done this spring and the outfield as a whole? So Trace Thompson got off to a really hot start and was just hitting bullets everywhere. And it seems like the last like week or so, his playing time has regressed and it's getting more into he's coming in in the middle of games. Uh, so I, I don't think Trace Thompson has an opt out at the end of the spring. I'd have to double check that. But if he doesn't have Voight and Choi. Voight and Choi. Okay. So if Trace Thompson does not have that opt out, then as unfortunate as it might be, it's probably better for the team for him to just go to AAA for a bit, stay off the 40 man right. roster. It's all a it's all a numbers game. And as far as just general competition on the bench, DJ Stewart having a minor league option remaining allows some level of flexibility. And when you go back to talking about the I don't want to talk about the bullpen, but within the confines of the bullpen, there's a lot of relievers competing for a couple spots that a lot of them don't have minor league options remaining. So if they don't make the team, boom, they're off the 40 man roster because they go to waivers and that can allow you to add a G man, G man Choi, like you mentioned, if, if they want kind of that lefty thumper off the bench, that's not DJ Stewart. It, it at least allows you that flexibility. Yeah. It's all about, you know, figuring out the rosters and, you know, I don't want to say how you manipulate it, but what cards you could play out of the gate. And yeah. guys without options, those are not cards you could play out of the gate to get cute with. I mean, there's just a reality that if you don't have them on the team, they probably will go somewhere else with a major league opportunity. So it's it's almost the equivalent, in a sense, of thinking you could just practice squad every every player in the NFL. And then there's teams out there that go, we actually have a need for this guy. That's what's going to happen in baseball, especially with arms. Trace is a really good one to bring up, Joe, because I do think there would be value to having him in Syracuse with the not only the rate outfielders get hurt, but unfortunately the injury rate that the Mets outfield currently consists of with Bader. I know I brought up Nimmo playing over 150 games the last two years, but Starling Marte, I mean, it's just, it's a reality that you need outfield depth. All right, back to YouTube. Uh, Dude, dude, 7650 said, asked, is there a hitting lab for player development as well? Or is it something or something like that unnecessary? So... There is not a hitting lab. However, they, David Stearns, I believe he did an interview or talked about it with the New York Post, I believe. Um, I could be wrong, but he talked about the pitching lab and basically said there is a space in there for hitters that over time they think they'll be able to get use out of it. The reality in the business of baseball is that pitching information is much more known and quantified than hitting. So I think from an analytical standpoint, offense is behind pitching. So I think that's a, in time, they'll be able to utilize that space for a similar type of action that they do um, their pitching development. Uh, so I don't think there'll be a separate place. They'll just kind of split up that warehouse that I want to get a secret key card into C. Uh, and, and that's when hitters will learn from it. This is the Mets pod presented by Tri-State Cadillac. Elevate your style in a Cadillac. Go from bold to bolder in an SUV, from inspiring to awe-inspiring in a sedan. Visit your Tri-State Cadillac dealer today. And remember to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your shows. Leave us a review with a question, and we'll look for it for a future mailbag. And, of course, if you watch the show on SMY's YouTube channel, Become a subscriber, leave a question in there. We will use those as well. Make sure you watch the spring breakout game on SMY, 3 p.m. on March 15th. The Mets, young risers against the Nationals. Because Joe will be on it. So if you haven't had enough of Joe talking prospects on this show, and I know you all haven't, 
Make sure you watch the spring breakout game on SMY. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll catch you next week.